Second Escape from the Democrat Plantation by Candace Owens. This is a book that I read in about a day. It's fascinating. I'm going to give you 10 takeaways of why I think this book is awesome. And we're going to start right now. So when I first picked up my copy of Blackout, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I thought from, you know, reading the cover that it probably would be an autobiographical type book, which it most certainly was, but it moreover was a book about conservatism from a basic one-on-one type level. And I was reading it and I was like, you know what, this would be a really good textbook for someone who was just getting into the movement. They just went Blexit or they just walked away. It's great. And I was really impressed by the wording that she used, how she was able to use analogies and the, and she brought in quotes from the Bible, quotes from Plato, quotes from Confucius, from different areas like that, from different authors. And I thought that was really good because no matter where you come from in terms of your walk of life, there's something in this book that's for you, especially if you're an independent thinker or a conservative or simply a Candace Owens fan. And so the book is broken down into 11 chapters, a conclusion, introduction and a forward by the great Larry Elder. And let's start there. Larry Elder is her mentor. And this is a guy who's been around for a long time. He is a person that is just the OG of conservatism when it comes to blackness. And really he holds his own with anybody. The way he's able to frame arguments goes alongside with what Candace does, but she takes it to a level that really goes to the people of today, the next generation. But Larry Elder sets the tone in the introduction in his forward. He goes over a lot of statistics, he covers it brilliantly, and he just sets the stage for Candace. It's almost like a passing of the torch. I thought it was phenomenal. Going into her introduction, she kind of gave an overview of herself and where we're heading. She mentioned about Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican Party, and this actually is my first takeaway. First takeaway is the history of conservatism, which really is in the next chapter. I'm maybe getting ahead of myself. But the key point here is that Rutherford B. Hayes was the President of the United States was a Republican, the party made a deal with Democrats that if they removed the troops, federal troops, out of the South, that they would acquiesce and let Rutherford B. Hayes win the election and become president. That happened, unfortunately, for the people in the South because once that protection was removed, all of a sudden they were inundated with all kinds of bad things. That really began the, the era of oppression in the South at that level. You know, with Jim Crow and the Klan, poll taxes, segregation, the whole nine. The second takeaway I have for this book is that she mentioned something called lament versus promise. How Democrats lament about black people having issues and problems and all of that. And then they promise to do something about it. That garners the black vote. And then the Democrats do nothing. And then the Democrats lament about why things aren't so bad. And then they promise they're going to do more. And then they vote. And then they promise, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the cyclical paradox that they back to have been in for a long time and it's worked very, very well for so long. I thought that was a very good analogy. And the key thing and the overlying thread of this book is black victimization, either being victimized internally or being victimized from outside. Either way, the effects were the same. And I thought that was really good and a very poignant point for her to put in the book and laid the tone at a very early stage in the book. So my third takeaway in this book is my amazement of Candace Owens' experience when she was a victim of a hate crime and she was in high school. It was a very traumatic experience. And I think if you are a Candace Owens detractor, I think if you read this chapter and understand everything she went through and you marry that with her grandparents, her upbringing, her love for the black community, her love for her family, her dedication and her hard work, I think you will understand very easily how she was able to get to where she is today and how she can be easily misjudged. Now, what's interesting about this is that she laid out a scenario where she was a victim of cancel culture, where the NWACP came in to help her, but really did nothing more than self-serve their own interests. And she laid out that particular narrative going forward about being a victim and how that can play a big role in everything that we do. And that victimization is the theme throughout the rest of this book. My fourth takeaway is the Lyndon Baines Johnson Great Society. His proposal to make the country better through social programs and ultimately it hurt black people. And this is a good part of the book which I realized that 
but I didn't realize, and this right here is the takeaway, that I did not understand how badly the black family took a hit because I knew that it was bad, but based on what she was laying out in this particular chapter of this book, she laid it out there in ways that I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And she lays out statistics and quotes from Lyndon Johnson, how he would constantly use the N word or how he would use his political skills to get what he wanted. And he understood that the black vote was going to go away from him. So the best way to do it is to invite them in, give them what they want, not allow them to move up. And that was what the Great Society Act did, and it totally destroyed the black family. So for my fourth takeaway is that I did not realize how the Great Society destroyed the black family as it did. So the fifth takeaway I have in here is a paradigm that she came up with called shouldn't and couldn't. And she brings it out in a way that I found very profound. And this is in chapter six of the book. And what she means by this is that prior to the Civil Rights Act of 64, there was this mindset that black people couldn't do something. Okay. It came from the government. It came from white supremacy, whatever you want to call it. But then after that, it became a notion of you shouldn't do that. First of it, because you can't do it because you're black and you can't do it. And the second reason after the Civil Rights Act was signed, you shouldn't do it because you can't possibly do it as well as we can. You need some help or some assistance. So in other words, you're a victim. And there goes that whole thread down the line to where we are today. And embracing that victimhood mentality has led to catastrophic things in the black community that we're still suffering from to this very day. I'm going to paraphrase something out of the book. I'm going to read it here as I took notes. I'm going to read it. And it's not going to be exact to what it was in the book, but it's going to be close. And it's something that she put out there that I found that was really good. And it may help you to understand when we deal with liberalism and progressivism, how they are not really on the side of black people. She says here that the belief that white people must assume all the responsibility for all of the black America's shortcomings is a form of white power. For, for one would have to take the notion or the thesis that Black America is not responsible for any of its own shortcomings in a free society. So that was very profound. And that's something that I had been thinking for a long time, but had never seen it put in the words. And now I have it. So, so for my sixth takeaway, it's going to come as a shock to many of you, but that is, is that shame is something to be embraced. And she shares an experience in her life where she gets pretty transparent and she wasn't proud of it. But how she said that that event could have been a turning point for her because had she taken it in a different direction, her whole life could have been different. But she embraced the shame and it made her know not to do the same thing again. And that if we have regrets, we need to take those regrets and use them for the positive. She shared an example of a friend of hers named Alexa, how they went different ways, how Alexa wanted to be an actress and go to Hollywood and Candace Owens just wanted to work hard and pay down her over $100,000 student loans. And little by little, she was able to do that. And then the other side of that was her friend didn't. And then long story short, her friend has regrets. And from that became bitter on society and, and started to embrace a lot of the socialism leftist side because what Candace was saying was she framed it in a way that leftists many times have to blame something, have to blame the country or society or the man. Otherwise, they would have to look at themselves internally. And so that right there was a very big takeaway for me. My seventh takeaway in a similar fashion, how I wasn't aware of how badly the family went down after the Great Society Act. Well, for number seven, it's going to be, I wasn't aware how badly black culture had gone down since that same period as well. And black culture now is such of a point where of degradation that it's cool to be on the class. It's, it's cool to be a non-achiever. It's cool to be anything other than a positive person. And that to me plays a hard line effect on kids and dealing with broken English and not wanting to study and not wanting to act like you're white is something that is very, very prevalent. I dealt with that when I was growing up and she told the same story nearly 20 years later. And in her generation, the same thing's happening. So I'm assuming it's not getting much better. 
She laid out the example of Hillary Clinton talking about the hot sauce in the pocket, trying to, you know, pander to the Breakfast Club, the black radio program. And then she talked about Joe Biden doing the same thing, how he got angry at Charlemagne, the Lord G God, when Charlemagne said, hey, can you come back? We'll do another thing. And Biden was like, hey, <laughs> if you don't know by now, and you're not going to vote for me, then you ain't black. And she reminded me of that context of what that was about and that how Joe Biden to her was someone who broke English to a black person and talked down to them where she couldn't find anywhere else where he talked to a white person the same way. And also he basically blatantly said, look, I'm a Democrat. You're black. You should vote for me. Otherwise you ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that was really a slap in the face when you look at it from that perspective. Now, obviously when you said it, we all knew it was bad, but the way Candace tells it again, giving the full context of it, it's really, really horrible. And lastly, she made the assertion that black culture is about being cool. It doesn't matter about anything else, about achievement. It's about being cool. If that means you fail your classes, you're late for class, you have your pants down, you do this, you do that, you do all this sort of thing to get into trouble. As long as it's cool, then you're good. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And that lays out the fabric of everything else of being a victim. Again, every single chapter in this particular book is related to some kind of way being a victim. So for my eighth point, it's going to deal with something that actually came at the end of the book, but the 10th one is so good that I want to save it for later. This particular point is this, that President Trump was the man that the black community needed at the time that the black community needed him. And she says this through the experience that she had when people come to her and say, hey, Candace, you know, we like what you say. We understand the conservatism. We get that. But Trump, come on, really? And so at the end of the book, she makes an argument for Trump. And basically was that he was the kind of man with the audacity to speak the truth, to break through the victimization of black people and be honest. And that in combination with him not being an establishment Republican or an establishment politician gave him way more street cred, especially when you talk about him back in the eighties and the nineties, it just made perfect sense. It was a perfect marriage, the perfect time, the perfect place for a society and a culture that needed to hear that so badly because the Democrats are just pumping black people's heads full of stuff to get them to vote every four years because they can't get below that 20% margin that they have to have to win 20% of the black vote. That's what I'm talking about. And so that is what the pandering happens. That's why you have the hot sauce. And so that was a good point. And I really appreciate her mentioning that giving the case for president Trump with the black community. My ninth point and ninth takeaway from this book. And this also comes at the end of the book is that black people need the constitution and this is interesting because right now in society, it's commonplace now or popular to diss the constitution and say it's old and outdated. But when you really look at it, the constitution is what's keeping people free and particularly minorities free. And in particular, this particular video and context, black people are being kept free. Why is that? Because the constitution keeps our fabric together, our laws together that says that we get our laws and our governance from a higher power is not from mankind that our rights cannot be taken from us and therefore all that comes into play in terms of keeping people free the further you get away from that and embrace socialism embrace humanism embrace all of these things from the progressive movement then you move yourself away and you end up becoming a victim and you end up being victimized because you're being taken advantage of. And that's what we're seeing. Only can we be free to understand all of this. Do we understand how we can actually come out of this? And that segues into my 10th takeaway. And that is this. She gave an analogy of Plato, a story she gave. And you may have heard this. I had not heard this. This is a story of essentially prisoners versus sunlight or prisoner versus the truth. And essentially was people are clumped into a dark cave they can't see. One person breaks out, the sunlight's there. After being in the dark cave for so long, that person fights and can't deal with the, the light because it's so blinding and, and, and you can't see. But it takes time for that light to get into the brain and the psyche and you, you get used to it. And finally you can see clearly, you can see the night sky, you can see all this stuff. And now you realize that, wow, I was in the dark for so long and that light that I thought was my enemy at first was actually 
helping me. So now I want to go back into the cave and free people. But the problem is you go into that cave and now you're adjusted to light. You go in there and you really can't see anything now. And so it's difficult to go into that situation because it's, it's hard and it's very, very dangerous. You could bump into somebody, but also dragging someone out of there into the light, kicking and screaming is very difficult. And that analogy deals with truth, slavery, mental, and both physically. But the sun is dealing with truth. And that is what this is about. It's facts. It's truth. It's putting something in the mind of someone that was not there before so they can think clearly for themselves. And so it takes a struggle to do that. And it's tough, but it's worth the effort. And I think that's a fantastic way to wrap this book up and this review up. I think Blackout is a fantastic book. It's going to be talked about for generations. I think the new generation beyond Candace Owens are going to be reading this for years. As a textbook, more or less, it's indexed very nicely. You can look at the chapter headings and know exactly where you want to go. Jump in there real quick. The chapters are not long. You can read the book in about seven hours if you just go straight on out. And it's a really good read and it's very compelling. Filled with information and facts. It's up to date up to George Floyd, at least till May 25th of 2020, maybe beyond that. It's really contemporary in its, in its language. She uses language that's not really appropriate for some kids, but she keeps it real. And that's why I think this is the next generation beyond Larry Elder, who's always going to have his place because he obviously gave his sign of approval on this from his incredible endorsement in the forward. And so with that, this book comes with a high recommendation on my behalf and the conservative take. But the important thing is this, what do you think? Did you read Blackout? Are you planning on reading it? Let me know in the comments below. What do you think about my 10 takeaways? Were there more or were there less? Or do you think I overstated some things? I'd be curious to know what you think. And if you like what I do in this channel, where I take content of culture, TV, movies, and politics and filter it to you the right way, then please click that like and subscribe button and that bell icon so you don't miss any future content. And please go to walktheway.net and make it known when you first walked away, share with your friends, and also check out some content that I have right here.